Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are gathered here for the first Revati and Satya Nadam Atluli lecture, uh, award chair award lecture. About um, a year and a half back, we began a process of trying to bring into IISC 90 chairs to be held by faculty of the institute based purely on their academic performance of which uh, 20 would be for associate professors, 10 for full professors, and 60 for young investigators, assistant professors. So uh, after a year or so of looking around, we finally got a donor in the way of Professor uh, Satya Luri, who has uh, endowed this chair in the name of his wife and him. Um, today, uh, to preside over this lecture, we have uh, a very distinguished uh, member of our community, Professor Rama Rao, who is also a council chairman. I will briefly introduce him, and then he will talk about the uh, um, uh, talk about the donor himself, whom he knows, and then Professor Omesh Varshne will, uh, will introduce the speaker. So Professor Rama Rao, of course, is very well known to us. Uh, he is an alumnus of IISC, he is a Padma Bibhushan a very distinguished physical and mechanical metallurgist. Um, he joined IISC uh, in the Department of Metallurgy, then moved on to BHU, and uh, where he has, was on the faculty. He also had a long stint in, the, uh, in government laboratories like the DMRL, and was uh, Secretary of DST. Um, and he has also, also been on the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. He has a whole host of honors, which I will not uh, embarrass him by reading them out. All I can say is he's a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering, and he's a Padma Vibhushan. May I request P Professor uh, Rama Rao to preside over the lecture. Professor Anurag Kumar, Professor Umesh Vashne, Professor Rahul Pandit, Kuji, and our speaker, Dr. Rishikesh Narayanan, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Satya Atluri <coughs> has a very distinguished academic career. He is a PhD from MIT, USA, and is at present a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at uh, Texas Tech University. His interests <coughs> are in the following disciplinary areas. I have just chosen four, <coughs> computational mathematics. Essentially, he is a theoretical man, theoretical applied and computational mechanics of solids at various length scales and various time scales. Computer modeling in engineering and sciences, meshless and other novel methods in computation and co uh, computational methods. Structural long longevity and health management. As uh, uh, Umesh Vashne was mentioning, he was all over the place, been all over the place in the United States. He has ta started several well-known universities, MIT, Georgia Tech, California at Los Angeles, and also Calif University of California at Irvine. Above all, he is an alumnus of the University of Science, Bangalore, in the Aeronautics Department. I met him actually uh, <coughs> nearly three decades ago. One fine day in the afternoon, he dropped in at my office when I was directed to DMRL, actually from nowhere. I didn't even know where he came from. He just said that he wanted to have a chat with me. He had a good chat about various things. And I found him very knowledgeable about Indian science and Indian scientists and to some extent Indian politics. Ever since then we have maintained contact and this contact has been nurtured steadily and has grown. Even at this age of 73, Professor Atluri is one of the most hard working researchers that uh, I have come across. His output is remarkable, prodigious. Hundreds of students and hundreds of publications. Many of his students have been Indian scholars. 
he has been wanting to do something to his alma mater, Indian Civil Science Bangalore, and the result is this uh, chair, Revati and Satyanatham chair for an associate professor, which has been awarded for the first time to a meritorious speaker this afternoon, Dr. Rishikesh Narayanan. For those of you who come from Andhra Pradesh, that uh, Natham may have uh, some interest. He is born in Gudiwada. Some of you may connect uh, with this place. The point to note is that it is not often that we come across academics, you know, <coughs> doling out substantial amounts of money to set up chairs. This chair cost him more than two crores. And if uh, I am not wrong, the first chair to be set up at Institute of Science by a full-blown academic. Academics are not very rich people, as you know. They derive their pleasure from something else. He is a proud recipient of the civil and honor, Padma Bhushan, in the year 2003. In 2009, he, um, he, uh, 2009, he was inducted as a corresponding member of the Academy of uh, Athens, Greece, which is one of the oldest <coughs> academy of scientific and philosophical society in the modern world. So we have um, a very, uh, we can be proud of this uh, alumnus of Institute of Science and has also been a very generous hearted individual. So now I request Dr. Umesh Varnayam uh, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Rishikesh Nairanan, who is more properly known as Rishi. Rishi is actually son of the soil here, uh, and he really doesn't need much introduction. But to keep with the formality of the lecture, uh, let me just tell you some things about him. He did his undergraduate degree from Mapko Schlenk Engineering College, Shivakashi. Most of you know Shiv Kashi. Uh, this college is affiliated to Madurai Kamraj University. And subsequently, he joined ISC, where he did his MSc Engineering with uh, Professor uh, Y.K. Venktesh. He then continued in the same laboratory to do his PhD uh, with uh, uh, Professor Y.V. Y. Y. Venktesh in 2002. He then moved to the neighboring institute, uh, NCBS, National Center for Biological Sciences, to do his first postdoc with uh, Shona Chatterjee. And then he moved to UT Austin to do a second postdoc uh, with Professor Daniel Johnston. He joined at ISC as faculty, assistant professor in 2009, and was then promoted to, 2005, uh, uh, to associate prof professor in 2015. And he has really done outstanding work, which has also been recognized by many, many awards. He's uh, a recipient of Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Award. Uh, he's a senior fellow of Welcome Trust DBT and the Alliance, a very prestigious fellowship and the funding agency uh, to support research in the uh, laboratory. He's also a uh, uh, HFSP Career Development uh, Award holder and uh, He's received many, many fellowships from HFSP to carry out his research. It's no surprise that he actually competed extremely well uh, for this uh, uh, associate chair professor, which has been instituted at the institute uh, very recently. And Rishi is really the first recipient of this uh, 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 chair award lecture. So with those few words, now let me invite Rishi uh, uh, to deliver the first Revati and Satya Nadam Atluri uh, Chair uh, Award Lecture. And the title of his lecture is shown over there, Dan Rice, Active Trees in the Brain. Appreciate. Professor Ramarav, uh, Professor Anurag Kumar, and Professor Vashni. Uh, 
thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, having me. I would first like to thank um, uh, Professor uh, Satyanadam Atluri for uh, um, 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 being the donor for this particular chair. Uh, and I thank the committee members uh, for uh, selecting me as the first chairholder. Um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, uh, Dendrites Active Trees in the Brain. Now I would like to go uh, step by step, let us see where we get uh, as we go through. So I call my laboratory as um, the um, laboratory as the cellular neurophysiology laboratory. The, there are several research themes associated with this. Um, So, so the one of the main themes that we work on is degeneracy in the hippocampal formation. The second theme is active genetic physiology and the third theme is um, calcium physiology and plasticity. Um, so the institute audience has uh, heard me speak about degeneracy in the hippocampal formation in, in recent times. So, so for this particular talk I decided to pick this theme uh, for uh, uh, presentation over here. Uh, so I will try to um, um, put together a broad overview of what we do in the laboratory within this particular theme over the past uh, five years uh, and broadly speaking the techniques that we use uh, are electrophysiology mostly in vitro electrophysiology we are trying to move into in vivo electrophysiology imaging calcium imaging mostly and computational modeling uh, and the animal model that we focus on is on uh, um, rodents basically. So broadly I call it as the cellular neurophysiology laboratory because uh, we are interested in the function of the, the nervous system uh, and we focus on the cellular end of it not at the molecular end of it not at the systems end of it not at the behavioral end of it just like uh, any part of biology you can have research uh, spanning multiple scales um, and in our laboratory we would uh, we are trying to focus on the cellular aspects of it basically. So there are several people who have contributed to um, these different uh, research uh, themes within the laboratory. What I am presenting is a post facto cluster not necessarily a, a predetermined um, uh, cluster where people are um, put into specific clusters it is just that uh, they self organize into different clusters and uh, these are the set of people who have been working on uh, these uh, different uh, aspects of um, uh, um, the laboratory basically. So for today's lecture as I mentioned I would like to focus on uh, active dendritic physiology and I will uh, explain what I mean by active and what I mean by dendrites as I progress uh, because I thought uh, I should keep the, the talk much more uh, uh, general in that sense. So the word dendrites comes from the Greek word dendron uh, which basically means tree right. So, so that is the name of the um, this particular structure that we are going to be talking about uh, and as you can see these are some of the dendritic structures that you observe in uh, the, the brain. Uh, so this is the famous Purkinje cell and you see that uh, um, nice uh, arborization. So this is a cortical pyramidal cell uh, and you see that the, the cell body resembles a pyramid and therefore the name pyramidal cell basically. Right? So, so you have very different kinds of uh, uh, organization in terms of how these uh, dendrites arborize. Uh, and they look very similar to some of the trees that we see and therefore and the straightforward uh, nomenclature associated with them. So these are individual neurons. Uh. So and as most of us know um, dendrites are the primary sites for receiving synaptic inputs from other neurons uh, and neurons as you can see over here exhibit heterogeneous um, arborization uh, uh, very different. So if you have a typical pyramidal cell the probability that you would see an arborization like this which is for a Purkinje cell uh, is going to be very um, low I mean unless you have some kind of major uh, uh, arborization deficit or something like that. Uh, so they have very typical organization very typical um, uh, uh, patterns of branch and stuff. So historically dendrites are misconstrued to be of uh, nutritive value where they are just uh, passing on food uh, quote unquote uh, to the neurons uh, and they do not have any information processing um, uh, capabilities basically that was the, the idea and there are two kinds of I mean in this nomenclature you can also call your uh, dendrites to be passive uh, where they do not have what are called as active components which we will come in a minute. Uh, and they were thought to be as uh, simple funnels of information. So the idea was that uh, a single neuron will get around uh, 10 to 20,000 inputs um, and you can't accommodate all of them into the cell body. So you need more surface area for accommodating these different inputs coming onto this particular structure and therefore you need this dendritic arborization and therefore uh, you have to have this kind of an arborization. So they were thought to be as uh, simple funnels of information and they do not process any active uh, uh, processing uh, in those structures basically. But active dendrites on the other hand uh, are those dendrites uh, which possess uh, active components such as what are called as voltage gated ion channels. Uh, so these are um, protein molecules uh, 
which sit on the membrane and they allow specific kinds of ion to pass through either into the cell or outside the cell depending upon the transmembrane voltage. So, if you put an electrode inside and if you put an electrode outside and measure this voltage difference. Uh, so, that voltage difference is what is going to guide uh, what kind of ions are going to be passing through and whether the channel is going to be open or not. So, it is going to be a voltage gated uh, ion channel. Uh, so, these are active mechanisms because they are driven by um, the voltage that is uh, uh, passing across this particular dynamic structure and therefore they are called as active dendrites. So, the, the dendrites that have these components uh, would be what are called as active dendrites. Uh, so, the title of my lectures which, which talks about uh, dendrites being active trees uh, refers to uh, tree like structures uh, which have these active components present in them uh, and the active uh, uh, voltage gated ion channels present on them. So, that is what the, letter, the lecture title may refers to. So, like uh, most neuroscience lectures we will start with Ramonika Hall. Uh, who is easily considered the father of modern neuroscience. Uh, so, he had uh, based upon um, the, the neuronal structure that he looked through his microscope and drew uh, very detailed diagrams of uh, some of this dendritic arborization. Uh, he had come up with this idea of what is called as the law of dynamic polarization. So, so the idea is very simple from today's perspective. Uh, the idea is that you have this dendritic structures uh, which are receiving information from other neurons. Uh, and there is a cell body which is uh, um, a common connecting point uh, for various different dendrites that are reaching to this particular structure. Uh, and there is an axon, a single axon typically which sends out information from this particular neuron to other neurons that will receive information from this neuron over here. And there is also an axonal initial segment. So, the idea is that you will have these several inputs coming from other neurons which are synapses like this from other neurons. Uh, they make contacts onto these particular dendrites. Uh, and information flows unidirectionally from the dendrites up to the cell body where if there is a certain um, um, the, the voltage that reaches the cell body if it that reaches a certain threshold uh, then this particular cell will fire an action potential what is called as an action potential which will traverse through this and go to other neurons over here right. So, so the idea is that uh, there is a kind of summation of information over here uh, and there is a threshold device uh, which is going to ask whether the voltage that is coming into this particular cell is going to be beyond a certain voltage threshold uh, and an action potential will be generated if that particular threshold is reached basically right. So, so it is a very simple um, functioning uh, you have a simple idea of how a neuron functions. So, there are two components to it uh, one there is passive information flow two um, it is going to be unidirectional flow of information and all the active processes is going to be taking place in the cell body over here right. So, so based on this uh, so this is the common idea of uh, what we think a neuron does. Uh, so, you have a bunch of uh, inputs coming from different neurons which are shown in uh, uh, blue over here uh, and it, it reaches over here with a certain weight depending upon the kind of structures that are present over there and the distance uh, between this point and here right. So, if this uh, if there is an input that is coming over here it has to traverse all this distance and therefore uh, the amount of information transferred is going to be lesser. On the other hand if there is an input that is coming over here you would have a much easier access to the cell body and therefore uh, this weight is going to be dependent upon what is present over here and this um, this traversal of information along this particular structure. So, based upon that uh, we came up with this very simple idea based upon the law of dynamic polarization uh, that there is a summation device uh, which would weight all these inputs that are coming onto this particular structure uh, and this threshold device is going to um, ask whether it crosses a certain threshold and then send an output uh, based upon what kind of inputs are coming over here. So, that was the idea and uh, at that stage because we did not have the technical advance uh, advancement of uh, recording from these structures. Uh, so, these are like 2 micron in diameter. Uh, so, it is very difficult to record from these structures and uh, uh, unless you have like visually guided electrophysiological recording techniques. Uh, it is extremely difficult to record from these structures basically. So, as a consequence it was assumed without uh, appropriate experimental backing and data that this was going to be completely passive uh, and it is just going to be collecting information and feeding into this particular structure which is the main computational device uh, uh, which sets the threshold over here right. So, so however, um, if you look at research over the past two decades uh, mostly. Uh, people started recording from these genetic structure because uh, 
the patch clamp electrophysiology technique uh, came to a point uh, where you were capable of uh, looking at these dendritic structures uh, and recording from these thin dendritic structures that are present over there and therefore they were able to ask specific questions uh, as to whether these dendritic um, uh, structures do have ion channels uh, and whether they are indeed passive as the assumption was at that point of time uh, whether these are indeed passive uh, and things like that those questions were posed uh, and it turned out uh, that uh, these dendritic structures are not really passive uh, and they have several of these transmembrane proteins which are ion channels that are present over there uh, which exist through here so it's not something like a funnel so it's like a funnel that is passing information from several different neurons onto the structure but here you would see that uh, because of this active structures that are present over here you will have significant amount of processing that happens even here before it reaches the cell body so now the the, the, con the complexity of uh, this particular computational device uh, increases manifold for the simple reason that now you have uh, processing happening at each and every of these locations uh, not necessarily only at the cell body basically right so so that changed the the scenario of what exactly uh, dendritic structures are and what they are capable of basically but the question is i mean if, if, if something is stupid then evolution would have thrown it uh, a long time ago so so the question to ask is why do neural systems spend so much energy in placing these active mechanisms in dendrites uh, right so so you have these several different uh, uh, ion channels that are present over here uh, so it takes a lot of energy for uh, uh, the neuronal structure to transport these uh, ion channels into these dendrites and place them over there so why does it spend so much energy for putting it over there uh, and what are the basic implications for the presence of these active dendrites uh, for neuronal physiology and information processing so that has been the question that uh, that has uh, um, been central to um, active dendritic literature and this part of uh, my laboratory's work uh, also focuses on this uh, uh, some of the well established implications for the presence of active dendrites are uh, two one is that uh, um, action potentials which are generated at the cell body can propagate back into the dendrites uh, so and, uh, and the second is that uh, the cell body is not the only place where you can initiate spikes basically right? so so at that point of time we we thought that because of the law of dynamic polarization we assumed that uh, information is going to flow from here into the cell body and there is never information flow from here into the dendritic structure so this particular paper uh, which is the landmark uh, uh, paper which actually showed that uh, there is back propagation of uh, action potential into the dendrites uh, showed for the first time unequivocally that uh, uh, you do have information going back and forth uh, it's not unidirectional flow of information a and second thing is that uh, because you have these channels that are present over here even in the in the dendrites uh, so you have sodium channels present over here which are responsible for the generation of action potential that we saw earlier so now if they are present even on the dendrites uh, you can have uh, um, spikes initiated even at the dendritic locations uh, you don't have to have uh, the somatic location at the only point where you have spike initiation right so so those two became very clear uh, because of this so this is the first paper which showed that uh, there is back propagation of um, action potential and this is one of the several papers uh, that showed that even these uh, thin structures that are present over here are capable of this non-linearity that is shown over here so until a certain point it is kind of linear beyond that you have uh, um, these dendritic spikes as they are called as uh, initiated even the in these smaller dendritic structures uh, as a consequence of which you have these kind of things so those are some of the um, existing examples of where dendrites or active dendrites have a role to play uh, so as a consequence of that now if you have to think of a neuron um, instead of uh, the traditional approach of what we treat neurons as simple algebraic summation units so these dendritic structures are just algebraically summing the inputs there are excitatory inputs there are inhibitory inputs uh, you sum up the sum them up and you have a nonlinearity that is present over here uh, now this is being replaced by this particular structure where the dendrite is not passive anymore it's active and the information flow is not something which is unidirectional you have bidirectional flow of information and there is coincidence of inputs i mean signals that are coming from this side and signals that are coming from that side uh, therefore the complexity associated with what is happening within a single neuron is much more than what you would have had uh, with this kind of an algebraic summation unit over here right so 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 these are some of the implications for for the presence of active dendrites uh, so what we have been doing in our laboratory is uh, is looking at uh, the the several scales of analysis uh, uh, 
that you see over here. Um, so, just like any other field of biology, uh, neuroscience also proceeds in several scales of analysis. So, you could look at systems at the behavioral level that, or you could look at things at the genetic level or systems level, say visual systems and auditory systems and so on and so forth. Uh, and as I said, uh, um, the main focus of our lab has been at the cellular end of it. Uh, and we dabble into networks and into uh, the molecular side of it a little bit, uh, but uh, it's all centered at the cellular end of it. Uh. So I thought I'll start with uh, um, some of the things that we have found over the past uh, um, five years, uh, mostly. Uh, I'll start at the cellular end, uh, then jump to the network end and jump back to the molecular end and stop it at that. Uh. So for each of these uh, different scales, I'll try to give uh, two different examples of where we found uh, active dendrites to be useful uh, or uh, creating a, a sig significant difference. Uh, so the first one I would like to talk about is uh, a frequency selectivity in, uh, in neurons. Uh, so if you look at uh, neurons uh, and record from them, so what you are doing over here is uh, you are injecting a certain current uh, and you are recording the voltage from this particular structure. Right? So, so this is a current uh, which is uh, going to be of constant amplitude. Uh, but it has various different frequencies over here. So the idea is to find how exactly this particular neuron is going to respond uh, for these different frequencies uh, when you feed constant amplitude signals into this. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, this is a hippocampal recording and you observe that uh, the, 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 um, the response, the voltage response to this particular current uh, is maximal at this particular location and it is minimal on both sides. Uh, so if you take this envelope uh, and plot this over here, uh, so this gives you the frequency response properties of this particular neuron over here. So it turns out uh, that this particular neuron is, uh, is a resonating neuron uh, and it has a bandpass structure where it has a very I mean um, optimal frequency to which it responds to which is also called as the resonance frequency. And this is how you would record this. You inject this current into the neuron and record this voltage uh, and you get this um, envelope and you find out at what frequency does it maximally respond uh, and that is what is the maximal response frequency associated with that particular neuron. Right. So, so now if you look at and uh, look at this and ask the mechanisms behind this, uh, what are the mechanisms associated with this uh, frequency response properties. So you can ask that question in two, di two different ways. Uh, one is by um, uh, pharmacological techniques. Uh, what you do is you take a normal uh, kind of cell, I mean which responds like this uh, and you treat it with, uh, with the pharmacological agent. Uh, which blocks this what is called as the HCN channel. So this is the pacemaker channel. This plays a very critical role in uh, pacemaking in the heart as well. Um, and it has implications for uh, oscillations in the brain as well. Right? So, so you look at this and you block this particular channel um, and you observe that the frequency selectivity is now gone. Right? So what used to be a bandpass structure now becomes a low pass structure once you have this uh, blocker in the back basically. Or alternately what you can do is uh, you can find out the kinetics associated with this particular channel and introduce that into a simulation. So you have a model for a neuron without this channel, without this particular channel over here uh, and you measure the frequency response properties, uh, introduce this channel and repeat the same thing. So here it is 0, here it is something else uh, and you see that again there is the emergence of this. Uh, right? so, so these two together show necessity and sufficiency of, uh, of this particular channel uh, in bringing about uh, um, uh, frequency response properties in these kinds of uh, neuronal structure. And as it turns out, uh, if you increase the conductance of this particular, if the density of expression of this particular channel increases uh, on the x axis, uh, the resonance frequency, the frequency at which it maximally responds uh, also increases uh, monotonically. Right? So, so now I give you, if, if I give you this and I also tell you that uh, the, the density of these channels uh, is not something which is constant across the dendritic structure, uh, but it increases in hippocampal neurons and in cortical neurons. Uh, if you measure the density of these neuron, these channels as a function of distance from the cell body, you see that there is an increase over here. Right? So, so if I give you these two slides, uh, you would obviously predict that. So there is a non, a non monotonically increasing function of, uh, of resonance frequency versus the, the density of these channels. Uh, and as a function of distance, uh, this is monotonically increasing. So you would predict uh, that as the distance uh, changes uh, from the cell body, you would see that the resonance frequency also increases over here. Right? So that is what you would predict. Uh, and that is what happens uh, if you experimentally test this uh, 
by actually recording from these cell ball this uh, these genetic structures uh, at different locations uh, you see that uh, there is an increase in the resonance frequency uh, at the cell body it is on the order of at different voltages uh, and this is around 4 hertz uh, on the other hand this is around 9 hertz over here right. So, so you have a system you have a neuron which is not responding to the same frequency uh, optimally at all locations. Uh, but depending upon which location the input is coming on to you have different frequency response properties over here right. So, so that is the consequence of the presence of active dendrites uh, and you have uh, these different locations now having very different resonance frequency and therefore, they would filter signals uh, very differently when they come onto this particular structure. So, this is all with reference to in signals that uh, are below threshold where you are not generating any action potential, uh, you are not recruiting any of the um, action potential generating mechanisms. Uh. But now if you want to ask the same question as to whether you have this kind of a frequency response property in, uh, in uh, um, action potential generation as well, uh, you um, employ a construct that is called as the spike triggered average. Uh, so, this is a very old concept uh, which has been used for uh, I mean uh, um, more than uh, um, yeah, almost a century I would think uh, um, for understanding neurons basically. So, the idea is that you try to find out what the average stimulus uh, is for a neuron to trigger a spike basically right. So, so what is shown over here is a typical um, STA as it is called a spike triggered average. Uh, so, you have uh, um, this is the point at which the spike came in. Uh, so, what this particular st structure shows uh, is uh, that I mean if there is an input uh, that comes at this particular point over here, uh, then that is going to have a large probability in eliciting a spike, it should be a large input uh, right. And it also tells you that the inputs that come within this window which is called uh, which is also called as the coincidence detection window, you have uh, um, um, that particular region is going to maximally contribute to the spike over here right. So, and if there is an excitatory input or if there is a positive input that comes within this region that is going to negatively contribute to the generation of spike right. So, that is the, the general uh, idea for this one I do not know where uh, um, the rest of the sentence went. Uh, so, it should read as a single STA is sufficient to uh, characterize a single neuron. Uh, so, now what you do is you take this uh, particular uh, um, STA which is uh, uh, telling you what exactly is the um, is the um, the average stimulus that elicits the spike. Uh, find the Fourier, Fourier transform of this. Uh, so, this tells you what frequencies this particular thing is responsive to. So, so this is the stimulus that is going to maximally elicit a response in terms of spike generation. Now, uh, you ask what is the frequency response characteristics of this. Uh, this one also shows bandpass characteristics. Uh, you find that particular frequency and what Anandita showed uh, was that uh, even for so this is what I showed with uh, with resonance uh, where we injected chirp current and measured this uh, frequency response characteristic. Uh, here we use a system identification uh, um, uh, technique which is kind of popular in uh, in, in neuroscience. Uh, so, we have uh, um, these spikes over here and here also what Anandita found was uh, uh, you have uh, an increase in the frequency um, for distal dendritic locations compared to the cell body over here right. So, so this tells you um, that the the frequency preference or the the, the, the specific frequencies that a neuron is uh, responsive to maximally is dependent upon where exactly the inputs come in uh, and it is critically dependent upon the kind of uh, ion channels that are expressed over here. So, the, the, the prevalent dogma which should have come in the previous slide also uh, is um, that a single STA is adequate to characterize neuronal spiking uh, because I mean typically you would just have one particular STA and that would define uh, uh, the entire neuron. But because of this analysis uh, which shows that uh, the STA is something which is dependent upon location because of the presence of active dendrites, uh, you will have to have uh, a location dependent STA kernel filter uh, instead of having a single filter for everything that comes on to a single nonlinearity over here right. So, so this is one of the implications for the presence of that. Uh, the second part in the cellular scale is uh, Reshma's work uh, on uh, um, place field tuning. Uh, uh, so, as you are aware. Uh, so, the, the hippocampal formation which is uh, a dominant structure in, uh, in, uh, in the mammalian brain uh, rodents and, uh, and humans uh, is uh, critically involved in, uh, in spatial navigation. So, if you record from uh, a cell in the hippocampus, uh, so this is uh, um, the firing rate associated with that particular cell and these uh, wiggly lines over here are uh, uh, the movement of a rat in this particular arena over here. Right? Uh, 
and these red dots uh, correspond to um, action potential being spy being recorded from that single cell that you are recording from right so so as you as the rat uh, moves around over here you see that certain parts of this uh, this structure doesn't have many spikes uh, but as soon as the animal reaches one particular place cell location one particular location over here it elicits maximum number of spikes uh, and you also see that if you calculate the firing rate of that particular neuron it is highest at that particular location so these are what are called as uh, place cells uh, uh, they are present in the hippocampus and the nobel was uh, awarded for both place cell and for grid cells uh, so the grid cells are uh, in the entorhinal cortex and they have a grid like pattern uh, which we will not talk about uh, so so now um, the question that reshma asked uh, was with reference to these place cell uh, uh, firing over here so so if the animal instead of running in this uh, two dimensional arena if you have uh, the animal running in a one dimensional arena you will have the place field emerging like this uh, so within that particular place field uh, you will have a large firing rate uh, and on either side of it you will have the the cell not firing basically right so so the question that uh, Re that reshma posed was uh, whether dispersed synapses could yield a uh, uh, sharp place cell tuning uh, with the uh, dendritic spike initiation let me explain that uh, that title over there right so so um, so you have uh, um, so this is a single neuron right uh, and you have uh, the inputs from this particular place field as the animal traverses through this particular place field uh, the inputs that are coming from that particular location from the the presynaptic part of it uh, could uh, come on to this particular neuron at different locations it could all be at the cell body it could be clustered uh, in one particular uh, dendritic structure it could be clustered on two different dendritic structure or it could be dispersed all over the place basically right so so the prevalent dogma in the field uh, uh, at that time was uh, even now is that uh, you need to have synapses to be clustered like this uh, where they come and impinge on a single dendritic branch over here for you to be able to get dendritic spike uh, and sharp tuning of this particular place field uh, uh, firing over here right so so what uh, reshma asked was whether you could get uh, uh, sharp tuning as well as dendritic spiking with uh, with uh, uh, dispersed synaptic inputs where she randomly distributed these inputs uh, throughout the entire dendritic arbor there was no uh, specific localization or anything like that and she also ensured that uh, there was not many um, inputs which are close by to each other so what she found out was surprising right so so if you had all the synapses coming on to the cell body then i mean it's all on the cell body and therefore you have a sharp tuning over here uh, and on the other hand uh, what we expected to find was uh, if you have it on a single oblique or in two obliques uh, because of the generation of dendritic spikes you will have a sharp tuning uh, in contrast what we found was that it was flat right so compared to what you see over here you see that the firing rates are lower and you have much more uh, shallow tuning of uh, of place over here uh, and even more surprisingly when we looked at the um, the the structure where um, we had dispersed inputs where it was all randomly distributed uh, we had sharp tuning which was very similar to what we got with uh, somatic structures basically right so so then she went into uh, probing the the mechanisms behind what exactly could be leading to this uh, and she found that uh, in these structures uh, where you have uh, um, dispersed synaptic inputs uh, you still had dendritic spikes uh, so these are the color codes and you see that in this particular case uh, you have the um, the black action potential coming um, um, much after these different things that are coming first uh, so this is a dendritic spike uh, that eventually leads to a full blown action potential showing that even with dispersed synaptic inputs over here you can get uh, dendritic spikes and that is what led to the sharp tuning because uh, when she blocked the dendritic sodium channels uh, which are responsible for this uh, for this dendritic spikes uh, if you block the dendritic sodium channels you will get only somatic action potentials uh, and not anything else uh, and you see that uh, there is a significant reduction in the tuning over here right so so that significant reduction then in tuning is because you don't have any dendritic spikes uh, so what she showed was uh, you can get dendritic spikes with dispersed synaptic inputs and that will lead to um, sharp feature tuning over here uh, so she showed that that is because of the presence of active dendrites uh, without this uh, you don't get that sharp tuning over here right so it's very important to have that um, kind of a structure so then we will jump from the cellular end of it to the network end of it uh, so um, at the network end of it what we look at uh, are interactions across cells uh, so you are talking about how exactly different cells are coming together to bring about a certain phenomenon right so that's the question that we are asking so i'm going to show you two different examples uh, 
One is about uh, uh, ensemble recordings uh, from neurons uh, where uh, these signals are generated by combinations of several different neurons uh, spiking or getting inputs at the same time. Uh, that is one kind of thing. Uh, and in the second part of it, I am going to talk about interactions between neurons uh, and what are called as astrocytes. So, these are other kinds of cells that are present in, these, uh, in the brain uh, and how they interact with each other. Right? So, so, the first part of the work was done by um, Manisha. Um, so, you have uh, so, these are some of the electrophysiological recordings that you can get uh, uh, from, um, uh, from the brain uh, and these have been uh, used uh, both from the perspective of scientific research and for clinical diagnosis. Uh, so, there are several different things, this is the encephalography and you have local field potentials and extracellular action potentials and so on and so forth uh, and you also have intracellular action potential which is the kind that I was showing you uh, so far. Right? So, so let us focus on these extracellular field potentials uh, and if you record from from these kinds of uh, um, neuronal populations, uh, you will get signals like this, uh, which are kind of oscillating, uh, and you will have this sharp uh, um, spike like structure, which are actually spikes uh, from different neurons that are present. Now, you take this signal uh, and filter it into two parts. Uh, the first part, where you are um, passing it through a structure where you have uh, only frequencies lesser than 500 hertz. Uh, and that is called as the lo local field potential and you also have pass it through a high pass filter to get this uh, spike like structure um, and that will give you um, the spikes from multiple different neurons over here. So, this is uh, the kind of thing and you will have some electrode that passes through this uh, and you will record from different neurons. So, this uh, recording that you are observing over here is not a consequence of a single neuron, uh, it is a consequence of multiple neurons uh, sending their signals uh, to this particular electrode over here. Right? So, so um, Again, the prevalent dogma over here uh, was uh, that uh, you have uh, um, the LFPs uh, reflect synaptic inputs because there was nothing else present over here and therefore, if you put an extracellular field electrode over here, uh, this should reflect the synaptic inputs that are coming onto this particular structure. Um, on the other hand, with this uh, new realization that there are these genetic uh, ion channels. Uh, now, it stands to reason that if you put an electrode over here, this is not going to be something which is just reflective of the synaptic currents, uh, but it is also going to be reflective of the ion channels that are present on this particular dynamic structure. So, that was the, the, um, the, the, the hypothesis that uh, Manisha started her uh, uh, research with uh, and these are uh, um, um, the LFPs that she got I mean have from, from different locations. Uh, and uh, she also got uh, these uh, spikes for individual neurons. Uh, so, you see that that is the local field potential uh, um, and you have these spikes uh, and you see that they have a preference uh, for a specific phase over here. Right? So, around 0 degrees is where they prefer to spike uh, and that is the kind of response that they get. Uh, now, she has the system uh, and therefore, what she did was uh, she introduced the same uh, pacemaker channel that we were talking about, uh, the HCN channels. Uh, and asked what exactly happens to the face of the LFP. Right? So, so, this LFP itself is an oscillation and therefore, it can shift this side and that side. Uh, and as a consequence of um, um, the HCN channel acting in a certain way, you see that there is a phase shift uh, in the, the um, LFP itself that is number 1. Uh, and number 2, when she added these, uh, these channels over here, you see that the spikes became much more coherent. Right? So, instead of being all over the place over here like what it is um, uh, here, uh, you see that uh, the spikes become much more coherent and they start spiking uh, only with reference to one particular phase uh, when the HCN channel density was higher in this kind of a scenario. And finally, she also showed that uh, the spike phases also were different um, because of the presence of HCN channel and they showed it for different kinds of densities over here. Right? So, so, now what she has shown is that uh, the LFPs that you get uh, are not necessarily just reflections of uh, the synaptic currents that are coming from here. They are reflections of A, the, um, the synaptic currents uh, and B, the ionic currents that are um, being activated as a consequence of the synaptic activation that is present over there. Right? So, so, she brought in uh, a new dimension of complexity into the whole thing uh, questioning in some senses, uh, in all senses uh, the, um, the prevalent dogma that it was purely synaptic. Uh, Second part of it is with reference to um, the interactions between uh, uh, neurons and astrocytes. Uh, so, this is one of uh, Ramoni Cajal's diagrams uh, and here uh, you see that there is this neuron and there is this uh, uh, astrocyte uh, which sends its processes uh, and it kind of engulfs uh, 
this entire cell body over here right so so these are more modern uh, techniques used to understand the interactions between neurons uh, and astrocytes neuron astrocyte um, so this is the postsynaptic side this is the presynaptic side and there is an astrocyte that is present over here uh, so if you look at these kinds of diagrams much more closely you um, realize that it's not just uh, a presynaptic structure which is releasing uh, neurotransmitter and a postsynaptic structure which is getting these neurotransmitters uh, but there is also a third component which is present uh, which is the astrocyte uh, which is another cell type uh, which doesn't fire action potential that surrounds it right uh, and it has been known for some time uh, that you can have uh, these astrocytes uh, release uh, certain active molecules uh, which can go and bind onto these receptors that are present either on the presynaptic side or on the postsynaptic side, uh, eliciting large currents over here. Right? So, so um, this is one of such recordings which was uh, uh, from another group uh, which showed that if you record from the cell body of these neurons that are present over here on the postsynaptic side, uh, you have these huge currents um, that come up uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, they are pretty large amplitude even on the cell body they are like 100 picoamperes. Uh, and pretty broad in terms of uh, how long they last basically right so but what was not known was uh, how exactly um, does the impact of glial transmission uh, affect the dendrites right so so because all the synapses come and make contact onto the dendrites uh, so now without knowing how exactly the glial transmission uh, is going to affect the dendrites uh, you can't make specific statements about how they are going to interact with the inputs that are coming from other neurons uh, so we did not know the mapping of this uh, and we did not know if uh, the presence of active dendritic conductances uh, um, affect the strength and spread of this particular impact over here. So Sufyan uh, 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 did this heroic experiments because these are like extremely difficult experiments. Uh, a patching onto dendrites is extremely difficult and B patching onto astrocytes uh, which are also uh, smaller in diameter with reference to the cellular uh, diameter of neurons. Uh, that's also difficult. Uh, he did both of them together um, and he showed that uh, uh, at the cell body you have smaller signals. Uh, so this is at the cell body and you see that there are smaller signals over here. As you go up into the dendrite uh, you start seeing these large amplitude signals uh, which are on the order of 20-30 millivolts. Uh, so these are not because of synaptic inputs because you do not have any um, active transmission you have blocked the sodium channels. Uh, so and he showed that uh, this was consistently the case uh, across different uh, structures basically. Then he did another set of experiments just to show that uh, these signals that he is recording is indeed from astrocyte and not from somewhere else. Uh, so for that again this is a bunch of set of bunch of uh, um, much more difficult experiment because you have to patch a neuron and then uh, patch another astrocyte uh, um, um, which is close by so that it has some kind of contact with this. Uh, so he patched onto a neuron and then waited for a certain period of time where he recorded these signals. Uh, and then patch the, the astrocyte uh, with something that would release the glial transmitters from there. Uh, so and he showed, uh, so this is the, I mean the dramatic difference that you observe before and after, right. So, so this is before and you see that these signals are extremely small. Uh, on the other hand, after you activate uh, glial transmission from the astrocytes, uh, you see that uh, the signals are much more larger, much more wider and they last for long enough. Uh, and he showed that it, it uh, was consistent across different locations uh, um, and different uh, recordings. Uh. And then he did not stop there, uh, he also asked whether the kind of channels that are present in the dendrites, uh, do they have any effect on uh, um, the signal amplitude and the kinetics associated with that. Uh, he looked at two different channels, one is the pacemaker channel that I have been talking about. Uh, Another is a transient potassium channel which I did not talk about but they are also present in the dendrites. Uh. And he showed them, I mean to cut a long story short, uh, he showed that uh, both these ion channels which are present on the dendrites uh, had a significant effect uh, on either the amplitude or the kinetics or both of them uh, uh, when you had uh, the blocker for that particular channel over here. So he took this data to a computational model uh, and he asked whether the spread of this particular uh, uh, glial transmission impact uh, that is also affected by these different channels uh, and he again showed that there is a significant effect of both the, the pacemaker channel as well as a transient potassium channel when they are present in the dendrites actually. Right? So, so here he um, looked at how exactly an astrocyte uh, which is a different kind of cell type interacts with the neuron and how that impact is being altered uh, by the presence of active dendritic structures uh, in the neuron. Uh, uh, um, that are uh, shown over in the in the neuron at the location of the arrival not necessarily at the cell body. So, so far the recordings were concentrated on the cell body 
Uh, what Sufyan did was uh, he took the electrode into the dendrite uh, and asked more uh, detailed questions about this. Uh, moving from here to here, um, so as I said, um, um, we also look into um, you know, what happens at the subcellular end of it uh, as to what kind of molecules and, uh, and the signaling mechanisms are present and how they spread and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is also Sufyan's work. Uh, so this is about uh, intraneuronal calcium waves uh, that are present. Uh, so you can measure propagation of uh, signals uh, in a neuron and let us say that this is the point of origin. Uh, it could be either voltage or calcium uh, and you can have you can measure how exactly it is spreading across the dynamic structure on either side uh, and you can model it as an exponential and you can fit an exponential and you can call this point uh, at which it reaches 37 percentage as lambda basically. Right? So, so there is a significant difference between voltage propagation and calcium propagation in neurons. Um, right? so, so if you measure voltage propagation and you plot the value of this lambda that is on the order of uh, hundreds of microns, uh, but for calcium it is less than a micron, it does not spread at all in neurons. Uh, it is very, very localized, um, it is like on the order of 1 micron and uh, that turns out to be an extremely crucial thing for uh, um, maintaining uh, um, localized plasticity and things like that. That is an extremely crucial number. Uh, if this spreads beyond this, uh, then pretty much hell will break loose basically. Right? So, so it is very important that this remains uh, uh, close by, but there are active mechanisms which can uh, ensure that the calcium can propagate uh, to a longer distance basically. Right? So, so what we have been talking about so far is about the plasma membrane where you have these different kinds of receptors. Uh, and channels, we have been act, uh, talking about what exactly is the impact of these channels uh, on neuronal physiology. But there is another membrane that is present within the neuron, it is like a network within the network. Uh, so it is called as the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so endo means inside plasmic means the plasma membrane and reticulum is not the network. Uh, so it is a network that is present within the entire uh, neuron and the ER as it is called as, as it is abbreviated as uh, goes wherever the neuron goes. Uh, I mean it, it, it goes into the thinnest possible structures uh, and they are present over there and there also you have these different kinds of channels. Uh, so one kind of channel that is present over there is what is uh, this one, this one which is the IP3 receptor uh, which is a calcium channel basically. So what uh, Sufyan asked in this question, I mean I will come to that. So he was interested in asking how exactly these structures interact with each other in an active dendritic structure. Right? So, so this is about um, um, propagation of calcium waves. Uh, right? so, so you have these, uh, uh, so that the, 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 the plasma membrane is somewhere out there. Uh, so this is the ER and you have this IP3 receptors let us say. Right? Uh, and when calcium is released uh, in only a subset of this, uh, it will just lead to a localized increase and it does not propagate basically. Right? So and even if there is a bunch of them, then it does not have any propagation. Uh, but because of the characteristics of this receptor, which is also dependent upon the cytosolic, I mean the, the calcium concentration, if there is a certain threshold reached, uh, it can start propagating as a wave basically. So it is actively propagated, uh, mediated by these IP3 receptors that are present over there. And if there are gap junctions present here, they can become intercellular waves and go to the next stage as well. Right? So, so uh, in neurons also have these kinds of calcium waves uh, and you can um, um, record them by um, initiating spikes in the presence of uh, a metabotropic glutamate receptor agonist. Let us not go into the details, uh, but you can get calcium waves which propagate from somewhere here throughout the entire structure. So that is a chymograph I will explain to you in the next slide. So what Sufyan was interested uh, was in asking uh, how exactly these two membranes interact with each other. So we have been now talking about uh, only how this particular membrane and the kinds of components that are present over there interact with each other. He wanted to take you to the next step uh, and ask questions about how this particular um, um, membrane and this membrane would interact with each other to bring about um, um, neuronal physiology. That was the question that he was interested in. Uh, so this is uh, uh, how it will look like. So, so if you do the same thing, uh, you see that there are in the, the absence of high concentration of IP3 in the cytosol, uh, you see that uh, the, the concentration of calcium is very low. On the other hand, if you have a larger concentration of uh, IP3 within the cytosol, it becomes a wave and it lasts for a larger period of time and you see that the numbers are also very different over here. Right? So and this is a chymograph. Uh, a chymograph is uh, uh, I mean uh, plotting technique where you put time on one axis and space on another axis. Uh, so this is space uh, which corresponds to this particular thing uh, along the trunk over here and this is time on the x axis and you see that uh, the calcium wave initiates over here and propagates into the dendrite and into the soma over here. Right? So, so he had this calcium wave. Uh, 
Now he was interested in asking about um, asking questions about how exactly this potassium channel would affect uh, the the calcium wave. So so this is how the calcium wave looked like um, uh, under normal conditions. When he changed the potassium channel concentrations, uh, he observed that uh, the wave started looking very different. Uh, there was a latency in terms of when exactly it peaked. Uh, the amplitude was lower as he increased the density of this particular uh, uh, channel. Uh, so there was a significant effect. Uh, of uh, um, the the presence of active dendritic channels in this case uh, the a type potassium channel on uh, calcium wave uh, propagation in this kind of a scenario right so so that is about calcium wave and finally um, calcium is uh, just the first step uh, in triggering the downstream signaling cascades it's a uh, uh, it, it it's the one that triggers several other things which would eventually lead to adaptation or changes in the neuron um, for bringing about whatever form of plasticity in neurons basically right so so, so we wanted to go um, to the next step below um, uh, calcium over here. Uh, so this is one of the uh, standard uh, uh, pathways which are which has been implicated in uh, in uh, uh, neuronal plasticity. Right. So so this is a kinase. Uh, so it's just an enzyme for now, um, and this enzyme would go and uh, I mean when it uh, is binds onto calcium along with calmodulin over here. Uh, so you would see that uh, that leads to um, I mean what is known as phosphorylation, and this can go and uh, change the different channels that are present over here. Right? So, so what Reshma did uh, was uh, uh, she uh, was interested in looking at what happens downstream of calcium. Right? So what we saw in the previous uh, um, uh, study, which was uh, Sufyan's, uh, was what exactly happened to the calcium when the ER also was involved. Uh, what Reshma was interested in asking was uh, we know that uh, the calcium spread is uh, is uh, is going to be minimal, uh, but what happens to a downstream molecules uh, when it comes over here to phosphorylated CAMK2? How does it look like? Uh, how does the signal propagation occur, and whether active dendrites do play a role over here? So this is the calcium spread, uh, and this is like 50 microns on each side, uh, and you can see that at this point it's like three or four micromolar, but it falls pretty sharply. Uh, so the chymograph again. Uh, and you see that it is very very localized uh, to the um, the central part uh, but if you look at the spread of uh, uh, the phosphor related CAMK2 you see that that is much more wider than what you see over here because of how the the on and off mechanisms work with that. So what uh, Reshma asked was uh, she took the, um, the, the same channel in this case uh, and asked questions about how exactly the peak calcium would change. Uh, how exactly the area under the curve for this one which is the, the area under this curve uh, and the peak of this uh, and the area under this curve would change uh, with the increases in this particular channel density over here right so and she showed that in this particular channel type uh, you see that there is a suppression of uh, the spread in all cases uh, on the other hand uh, when you have t type calcium channels uh, you have an enhancement uh, of uh, these different things that you observe over here uh, and so she concluded that the presence of active dendritic structures uh, would significantly alter the spread of these downstream molecules uh, by indirectly affecting the second molecule second messenger that is present uh, in this particular structure right so so um, so so we showed that i mean thus far if you look at any of the the signaling micro domains papers within the literature uh, you would see that they would use active and um, passive dendritic structures uh, which don't have any of this active components uh, and therefore, they would not have been able to understand the implications for active dendrites which are present over there. Um, right? So, so um, that is what Reshma showed. Uh, so, to uh, conclude, uh, I would like to I mean just put this slide up and show that uh, the presence of active dendrites imply that old models of neuronal function uh, need significant revisions uh, and neurons are complex computational devices uh, and not simple algebraic units. Uh, and as we saw if you include like. Uh, calcium and uh, signaling micro domains. Uh, uh, so, they are on the order of microns uh, which means that uh, each of these individual points is an independent computational device uh, which is capable of making decision for its own uh, and not something which is uh, going to be talking with each other uh, and therefore you will have to account for these complexities that are present within a single neuron if you are interested in understanding uh, how it processes information to go with this old model would be foolhardy. Um, and, uh, um, and I showed you some illustrative examples of work from the lab uh, which uh, uh, showed a uh, central role in for active dendrites in, uh, in brain physiology and it spans several different scales of analysis uh, and people are also trying to look at uh, the implications of active dendrites and uh, how they uh, 
they could change behavior and systems level uh, computations as well. Uh, we do not do that in our lab, uh, we confine ourselves to this part of it. Uh, so, those are the examples that I uh, gave you basically. Um, and these are the people who did the work, I did not do any of the work. Uh, so, I was able to show only um, work by four different people uh, and uh, the others uh, uh, also have worked on genetic structures. Uh, and those are the different uh, uh, funding agencies which have um, which have contributed to uh, work in the laboratory basically. I would still like to stop there and take it. But, uh, uh, but I was just wondering, I mean, are there, for instance, um, genetic or other disorders in which, let us say, the dendrites are insufficiently populated by uh, um, uh, channels or whatever it is, as a result of which some pathology comes out? I mean, uh, more than looking at it from a pathophysiological standpoint, people have started looking at it from a physiological standpoint okay. itself. Uh, so, people have been able to... Uh, make like uh, uh, drill holes into the into the skulls of rodents not humans <laughs> and the image uh, um, these genetic structures uh, as the animal is doing certain behavior uh, mm -hmm. so for instance uh, they have been asking questions about uh, the whiskers which are one of the most important uh, uh, I mean sensing mm -hmm. devices for uh, for rodents uh, they have been asking questions mm -hmm. about how exactly when you I mean move certain whisker uh, um, whiskers what exactly happens to the genetic uh, um, um, signals uh, what exactly happens when you present specific orientations uh, to the eye mm. uh, in the neurons in the visual cortex and so on and so forth. Uh, and they have also, uh, those are observational, I mean science observational versus interventional. Uh, so, they have also been intervening with it. Uh, so, what they do is they express specific kinds of uh, uh, receptors which can be activated by uh, light. Right. Uh, and they can inhibit only the dendritic portion <coughs> associated with it instead of uh, uh, inhibiting the entire neuron. Uh, so, they just shine light in that particular region and inhibit it uh, and let the animal perform the same behavior um, when uh, the light is not shown and let the animal uh, perform the same behavior when the light is shown uh, and ask questions about what would happen when you specifically impair only the genetic function. Right? So, so, those are the kinds of questions that people have been asking and, uh, and there have been both correlational and, uh, um, and quote unquote causal evidence uh, for uh, the role of active genetic computation in, uh, in uh, uh, several aspects of neuronal behavior. I put uh, causal in the quotes because uh, it is very difficult uh, in a, in a nonlinear system sure. uh, which is tightly coupled which is the brain, uh, it is very difficult to perturb one particular thing and say that this is what is uh, responsible for that. That causal establishment becomes much more difficult, uh, but as much as possible yes. these kinds of research have been done uh, pretty much with every sensory region which is accessible uh, uh, and there have been lines of evidence. Uh, uh, um, positive negative uh, to show that uh, the active genetic computations indeed do have roles in uh, in behavior one way or the other basically. Thanks for such Good a detailed you. answer. Thank you, that was a very intensive talk. So, I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned that there are variety of anatomical structures in terms of dendrite that somatic and then single oblique, double oblique and so on. So, do you comment that varying the number of single unique architecture is going to varying the uh, varying a particular anatomical structure like oblique or double oblique or the somatic or whatever, will it have an effect on the, the speed of transmission of the information in terms of functionality? Would you comment on that? So, you are, uh, the, the question is, I mean, just to make sure that I got the question right. Uh, so, so you have these various different structures, there is the trunk, there is the oblique and so on and so forth. Uh, and you are asking whether if you change the structure associated with this particular neuron, uh, whether there would be a change in the, in the propagation velocity and things like that. Is yes, that the, if you okay. so, um, so, the propagation velocity is dependent upon several factors. Uh, it is dependent upon the structure because, I mean, say for instance, if it is, uh, if it has to face like multiple uh, um, branch points uh, before it reaches that particular location and there are other escape routes basically, that would affect it one. Uh, the second that effect would be the diameter of the, of the cable itself. Uh, and the third one is the number of channels that are present, both active as well as passive channels that are present. Uh, so, there are several different factors that contribute to the propagation velocity. Right? So, so, only the structure alone would of course contribute to it, uh, but you can have a 
I mean, fat then right. Uh, so fatter the then right, you would have uh, the propagation velocity to be higher. That's the usual uh, uh, link basically. But you can still have a fatter then right. Uh, but you can have the channel density to be very different uh, and have the propagation velocity to be very different. So, so the short answer to the question is yes, the morphology would play a role in um, in propagation velocity. But there are also other different. Uh, um, components which would contribute to both passive and active propagation velocities. Uh, so that is not the only one actually. Right? So, please. Cool talk Rishi. Uh, uh, I was uh, wondering if I could ask a couple of related questions. Uh, one of the things is uh, uh, what is the output of the astrocyte that you know under myonostal uh, stimulus? Uh, in form of what chemical neurotransmitter is this and then secondly wherever you see the spike in the dendrite which is at a distant location is it uh, just the spatial distance between the astrocyte and that location on the dendrite or is it something uh, a, a different uh, property that gets affected um so um the first question um, so the actually i mean the the, the glad transmission could be uh, several different molecules it could be gaba it could be glutamate it could be as aspartate and things like that uh, here we left it deliberately vague because there is a debate going on as to whether it is aspartate or uh, or uh, glutamate uh, so they act on these nmda receptors which are uh, classically um, i mean uh, glutamate receptors but they also respond to aspartate uh, so um, um, we do not know we don't want to comment on whether it is glutamate or astrocyte uh, so the idea is that it releases one of these uh, active molecules which goes and binds onto the nmda receptor and uh, and uh, um, that leads to this uh, so, so the second question on um, on um, the the distance between the point of activation and the point of recording uh, uh, which is what the question is right uh, so so the 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 at the point of activation now uh, so the astrocytes get on to nmda receptors which are much more slower right so so the on the synaptic terminals if there is a neuron neuron connection now uh, so those are receptors which are much more faster right on the order of like uh, the the decay time constant would be on the order of 50 milliseconds or so uh, on the other hand if you look at these receptors which are nr2b 2d receptors uh, so they have a decay time constant of like 200 400 milliseconds uh, which is why you have those uh, um, those very slowly dying down uh, uh, things uh, and it turns out that the cable properties are um, much more uh, um, um, i mean uh, less punishing i uh, mean much less punishing uh, to slower signals uh, compared to faster signal because of the capacitance that is present over there uh, so the spread will be much more for these slower signals uh, so even if uh, you have the distance to be large enough uh, the the propagation will still be there uh, and because they are very large amplitude signal you have like a 200 300 picoampere current coming inside uh, which is a pretty large signal and therefore that can also travel down to even the cell body so we were able to see those signals as uh, 2 3 millivolt signals uh, even at the cell body which itself is uh, pretty huge uh, compare it with synaptic inputs that come on to individual neurons that's on the order of 0.2 millivolts uh, right so so these signals are i mean tenfold larger even at the cell body um, um, and if you record from the dendrite they are on the order of 30 40 millivolts As an engineer, my question is uh, see, you have considered the neuron and uh, the dendrites and the various uh, 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 structures which you are considering as a, just an electrical network. But what about the, and you are uh, considering, I mean, the, it depends on the impedance, whatever you have, the selectivity of frequency, it depends on the impedance and the damping characteristics of the network. But have you considered the matrix? Uh, matrix, cellular the, the cellular XSLR cellular matrix. Cellular tissue, uh, fluid. So, you, uh, you are not I mean, the, in, in this particular case, we have not considered that particular uh, aspect of it. The extracellular matrix, of course, uh, plays a critical role, uh, not just in terms of uh, um, bringing about appropriate diffusion for uh, for the neurotransmitters and the gliotransmitters to reach their uh, uh, location. Uh, in terms of uh, maintaining. Uh, the the balance uh, in terms of what goes into the cerebrospinal fluid the ionic concentrations and things like that uh, so the extracellular matrix does much more things than what we thought uh, they would be doing actually and uh, if you look at an electron microscopic picture of uh, 
of a neuropel. Uh, it's like so tightly packed, it's not like individual neurons placed over there. Uh, they are so tightly packed, the extracellular matrix kind of uh, also holds it in place basically. So, so yes, it does uh, affect everything. But as I said, I mean, it's a huge nonlinear system with I mean, so many interactions between each other. It's difficult to account for everything that is present over there. So what one does typically is that one chooses uh, specific aspects of it and shows necessity and sufficiency for that. And the hope is that uh, you will be able to build from that basically, right? So that's the idea. I might just follow up quickly. Sure. Um, the, the, the talk that I showed about uh, local field potentials, uh, there I needed those in the impedance calculations. Uh, without that, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, what people have done is they have put two electrodes. Um, they would inject a current into this particular electrode, both of them in the extracellular matrix. Uh, and you would measure um, the in a distance dependent manner uh, how exactly it is reaching at that particular location. And they would not just stop at that. Uh, they would also pass different frequencies on the kilohertz range uh, and ask whether it is purely resistive in nature uh, or is it also going to have a capacitive component to the impedance associated with it. Uh, and the short answer is that for the frequencies that we are interested in action potentials and stuff like that, it is resistive. Right? So, so for the LFP calculations that I showed, uh, it is purely resistive. Uh, so the capacitive part is uh, extremely minimal for the frequencies um, until like uh, 2, 3 kilohertz. Uh, you don't see any capacitive component. Uh, and even if you see filtering, it's because of the intracellular filtering, uh, there are long debates and arguments, but now it's kind of settled that it's purely resistive mostly. And uh, um, the filtering that you observe, the 1 over F signal that you observe in, in the brain is largely a consequence of the, the capacitive filtering within the neuron, not outside the neuron basically. There are long arguments and uh, um, several reams of paper printed. I'm sure we can continue the discussion over with me. Uh, I'd like to thank Rishi for an excellent talk. I'd like to thank the students for the hours to decide over the function. And uh, may I now request uh, the director to uh, felicitate the speaker. <coughs> this you are all invited to eat.